Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Philip O'Connell, and I've been asked to chair the next session uh, where we're trying to realise the promise of precision medicine. So we've heard a lot this morning and in the first session this afternoon about some of the challenges uh, in introducing precision medicine to the clinical interface. Uh, but if we do overcome some of these, and it does become a major part of the medical landscape, as we hope for, there will be significant regulatory, social and ethical challenges that we have to consider and deal with uh, as we go forward. In some ways, this is not unusual and it's been challenges we've had uh, for a long time. For instance, um, I am a nephrologist by training and when they introduced dialysis, they used to have panels in the early 1960s that decided who would go on dialysis and who wouldn't and that was a life to death decision. And there are a lot of these panels uh, especially in the US to deal with this issue. So what we're dealing with now is not new, it's just in a new context. But we do have a very expert panel here uh, to discuss that. There's a Dr. Gareth Bayham, Professor Michelle Haber, Professor Margaret Olatowski, who's a, a lawyer, Professor Robin Ward, and Professor Andrew Wilson. So I, after a brief introduction, I'll ask each of them to say a few words and then we'll open it up for discussion. Michelle Haber is the Executive Director of the Children's Cancer Institute at the University of New South Wales. Uh, her earlier studies were amongst the first characterising the complex molecular mechanisms underlying therapy-related drug re resistance, and she identified the relationship between high expression of multi-drug uh, transported gene MRP1 and the malignant phenotype of neuroblastoma. Um, she subsequently established high throughput chemical screening of small molecule libraries and developed novel MRP1 uh, inhibitors. And she is one of the founders of the National Zero Childhood Cancer Personalized Medicine Program uh, and has developed molecular diagnostic platforms that have improved risk assessment um, and doubled the survival rates in children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And I note that that group recently just had a publication uh, in Nature Medicine in some of their work. So Michelle, handing it over to you for a few words. Hey. So uh, together with the clinicians at the Kids Cancer Centre at the Children's Hospital, we at Children's Cancer Institute established the Zero Childhood Cancer Personalised Medicine Program to improve the outcomes for kids with the highest risk cancers. So Zero started as a New South Wales pilot study of just over 50 children and was then rolled out in 2017 as a national clinical trial for 400 children with high risk cancer, which is due to finish at the end of this year. And it involves all eight child cancer, all eight Australian child cancer treatment centres. So each child's tumour from around the country comes to Children's Cancer Institute in order to have whole genome sequencing, whole transcriptome sequencing and methylation profiling done on their tumour and the results are then curated and fed back to a single national multidisciplinary tumour board. Zero then uses this very comprehensive molecular profiling to identify the molecular drivers of each child's cancer and then to match these molecular changes with the drugs which are most likely to target them. And of course, the aim is to identify an actionable personalized treatment plan for each child within the clinically relevant time frame of under nine weeks. So, uh, as you've just heard, the, uh, we've had a, a publication in Nature Medicine last week, and that involved the genomic data generated from the first 250 children enrolled on the program. And there we were able to show that Zero identified the molecular genetic basis of a child's cancer in more than 90% of cases. It led to a change of diagnosis in over 5% of cases, and 70% of the children had at least one new potential treatment option identified based on their cancer's genetic makeup. For those children who had a personalized treatment recommendation and then actually received that therapy, in 30% of cases, the tumor shrank and in some patients completely regressed. And in another 40% of cases, the tumor stopped growing and stabilized. And so if we remember that these are all high-risk children with otherwise uh, completely unresponsive tumors and no other treatment options, 
These results, I think, are quite remarkable. And in addition, germline cancer predisposition findings were identified in over 16% of patients, which is double the previously published level. So on the basis of these results, we've now been funded by MRFF to roll out zero to all 1,000 children and young people diagnosed with cancer every year in Australia by 2023, not just the high risk patient. So zero offers a change model of care for children with cancer and can inform patient diagnosis, identify new potential treatment options, and identify families who may be at higher risk of developing additional cancers. So there's clearly enormous benefit from this information, but this doesn't come without considerable challenges in terms of embedding precision medicine in the health system, particularly now as we prepare for the expansion of zero, the zero program. So given the focus of this session, my key question is, how do we ensure the, accept, the acceptable and equitable implementation of precision medicine? In terms of cancer risk, prevention and early diagnosis, precision medicine is providing unique opportunities to introduce new models of care and surveillance programs to drive cancer control and ultimately prevention. But this is putting pressure on already overburdened and often ill-equipped familial cancer clinics leading to risk of inequitable care, risk to patient privacy, potential discrimination, and ethical challenges to the rights of family members. So how do we manage these risks? In terms of cost effectiveness, which was touched on previously, there've been relative, relatively substantial cost effectiveness assessments of precision medicine in the rare disease clinic, clinical genetics domain over the last three to five years but there have been no such assessments in the child cancer precision medicine domain. And yet it's critical that we understand the costs and socioeconomic consequences if we're to make acceptable and equitable decisions about who has access to precision medicine and when. Then there are the challenges in terms of equity of access. How do we overcome the challenges, which some of which have already been spoken about, of geographical isolation, language barriers, or different cultural beliefs, and ensure that precision medicine is extended to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, to remote and rural populations, or to culturally diverse communities. And finally, in terms of psychosocial report, we know that with the increased options that precision medicine brings comes increasing complexity, uncertainty and challenges, not only for patients and their families, but also for healthcare professionals. So we need to explore the psychosocial impact of precision medicine on these groups and then work out how to design fit for purpose support services and educational programs to empower them. So in short, we need to define the barriers that exist to utilizing precision medicine uh, that will result in an, uh, the, the barriers that exist to utilizing precision medicine in an acceptable and equitable way and to determine how to overcome these. Thanks very much. Thank you, Michelle. So is Gareth back online now? No, I can't see him. So, so Maybe I think it would be after that uh, completion, it'd be very good to get to hear from Margaret uh, Otlowski, who is Professor of Law at the Faculty of Law at the University of Tasmania and Deputy Director of the Centre of Law and Genetics. Uh, and her research is focused on health law with particular emphasis on euthanasia and law and genetics. Uh, she's Deputy Director of the Centre of Law and Genetics uh, she was made a fellow of the Australian Academy of Law and she holds an adjunct appointment uh, with the Menzies Institute for Medical Research. So Margaret's areas of research include end of life issues, family law, aspects of law and genetics, especially genetic discrimination, consent and privacy, biobanking and personalised medicine and regulatory issues. Uh, and she's really focused on the interface of law, genetics, ethics uh, with a strong law reform focus. So. Margaret, uh, we'd be very keen, I think, after that talk to hear what you have to say. Yes, uh, thank you. And also for the opportunity to participate. I'm delighted to, to have the opportunity. I think um, it's pretty well recognised that ethical, legal and social issues do have a really central role to play in realising the promise of precision medicine. This is recognised even in the National Health Genomics Policy Framework. And 
with a view to kind of minimising the risk and enabling maximisation of benefits and also fostering the all important trust in sharing um, of genomic information, which we've heard is so important. There are a number of particular aspects of precision medicine which have created um, a special challenges. Uh, the proliferation in the volume of data available, the imperative that we've heard about of data sharing and, and data linkage, and added to that, the identifiability of genomic data. And with big data analytics um, capacity, it makes it actually um, virtually impossible to promise anonymity, even if identifiers are removed. So the combined effect of these factors increases the risk of, of privacy breaches. So against that background, there are many potential issues, but the ones I wanted to highlight are firstly, the managing of incidental findings in both clinical and research contexts. And with the massive amount of information generated by precision medicine, this is indeed a challenge. And there's no national consensus at present as to what constitutes best practice um, in circumstances where clinically relevant information might um, arise um, through analysis, but which hasn't been sought out. So decisions end up being left to individual laboratories or clinical geneticists um, or, or researchers. So here I would call for greater consistency in approach so that all parties um, affected have a better understanding of their rights and responsibilities. Uh, a related issue is reanalysis and recontact in circumstances where variants which were initially deemed to be of unknown significance uh, become um, awareness is that they are clinically relevant um, as more information is gathered. And here too, there, there is no agreed position either for clinical or research contexts as to the extent of responsibility to reanalyze and um, uh, recontact and update. And this can lead to inconsistencies in information provision and outcomes. So I think there's real opportunity here as well for, for greater guidance for in both clinical and research contexts, recognising differences between those areas as well. Uh, and the, the final point I, um, or issue I'd like to identify relates to managing genomic data and really focusing on the fact that we've got in an unprecedented um, scale data being processed, analysed and stored. And this raises questions about how do we effectively manage this data in a manner that facilitates trust and sharing, which is all important, but also acknowledges the risks involved with large databases and extensive sharing and does enough to protect privacy um, interests of individuals and their families. So here I think there's scope for more attention to um, consent processes so people really understand risks and benefits of participation. Uh, and, and particularly where consent is sought in a clinical context for participation in research, that that's done explicitly and clearly and separately, but also attention to governance arrangements, um, including regulation of data access and a, a more open acknowledgement that de-identification of data is not a complete solution, uh, that we need to be really cautious about giving assurances to people about retaining patient anonymity and privacy when in fact that's not something we can absolutely guarantee. Thank you. Okay, um, I would note this is going to be a very interesting session because we're getting bombarded by questions on the chat function. So the audience is getting agitated in a very positive way. So I would now like to pass on to uh, Robin Ward, Professor Ward, she's the Executive Dean and Pro Vice Chancellor of Medicine and Health Faculty uh, at the University of Sydney. She's previously held senior positions at the University of New South Wales and University of Queensland, and was formerly director of the Comprehensive Cancer Centre at the Prince of Wales Hospital. Um, she, her, her contributions to medical research uh, have been acknowledged by her position at the Commonwealth Health Minister's Award for Excellence uh, for Health and Medical Research in 2004. Um, and uh, she's also, she's currently on the Commonwealth Medical Services Advisory Committee. And, and I do note to this topic that Robin did write a review in the Medical Journal of Australia saying precision medicine uh, in oncology uh, is the honeymoon over. So I'm sure she's got a lot of important things to say and a lot of insightful things to say as we try and progress this um, into more traditional medical care. Over to you, Robin. 
Thanks very much, Phil. Um, so this, um, my little talk here will probably take a slightly different um, focus than the previous speakers. Um, so I'm going to speak from the point of view of, of the chair of the Medical Services Advisory Committee. Um, that's a committee that's not responsible for regulation, it's responsible for making recommendations to the health minister regarding reimbursement. Um, that's the use of taxpayers' money to fund uh, services, tests, gene therapies. Um, so anything that isn't um, a pharmaceutical, which Andrew Wilson will talk about in the next session. So the topic of genomics, gene therapy and precision medicine is certainly something that is very much um, a topic of uh, regular um, meetings of, of MSAC. And essentially the way the um, health technology assessment committees, there are two in Australia, as I say, MSAC and PBAC are configured. They're designed to look at the clinical utility of um, new interventions and existing interventions. And by that, I mean, look at whether these new interventions have an impact on health outcomes. Um, and that's traditionally whether someone lives longer or lives better, uh, the evidence base supporting the claim that there's an improvement in health, health outcomes, how much it costs to deliver that health outcome, which is cost effectiveness. And many people have spoken about cost effectiveness or alluded to it today, and the total budget impact of that investment. And I think one of the things that precision medicine and genomics and gene therapy and all the things we've been talking about today are beginning to challenge us in the way we actually look at this idea of cost effectiveness, clinical utility and budget impact. So there are four challenges that I just wanted to touch on. Uh, the first one is new concepts of value. So I think, as I've said, we're all very familiar with the fact that something a new treatment saves our lives or improves our quality of life. But increasingly, uh, that the concept of a health value is being expanded into things like diminishing diagnostic odysseys, the value of naming a condition. So just being able to um, label a condition so that you um, can identify, therefore, groups of people who have a particular uh, disease and therefore uh, undertake research and, and hopefully identify new treatments or new ways of managing the disease. So there's a value in in naming a condition. Values in knowing with greater certainty. So we might have a series of tests that say, well, we've got a 70% probability of, of disease X, but if we have a genomics test on top of that, that probability might be 95%. So that's that has a value associated with it. So these ideas of what is health value has begun to change, um, includes things like family planning options. You know, the whole family could, now be better in a better position to work out um, what their family choices are going to be. So they're concepts of values that have been around for a long time, but are becoming codified in the um, into the health technology assessment arena now as things that people wish to pay for uh, with taxpayers' dollars. So that's the first challenge: challenge of new concepts of values. The second con challenge I wanted to bring up was the beneficiary of genomics and testing. And I've, as I've just said, um, we've traditionally thought of the beneficiaries of, um, of new tests and new interventions as the person who's sick. But increasingly this concept is coming up that um, the beneficiary is not just the individual who is sick, but also beneficiaries uh, extend beyond that to the p families that are looking after uh, people who are unwell, uh, societal values beyond uh, the individual value of um, being made well when you were, were ill. And as I said, um, reproductive choices um, extend the concept of beneficiaries beyond the person who's actually having the intervention or treatment. The third challenge I wanted to mention was the unit cost of many of these interventions. So we've we've heard about some of these from Ian Alexander earlier today, but some of the new therapies, CAR T treatment and the like, um, run at a tag of about two hundred and fifty, three hundred thousand dollars of treatment. And I guess for the average taxi driver in in any country in the world, that would seem like a lot of money. Obviously, if the disease is cured and that. Um, results in a normal life for someone, then um, perhaps that unit cost is, is worth paying. 
but these um, eye-watering costs of treatment are being balanced now against the, the cost of, say, providing statin therapy for large populations of people and preventing disease down the track because of early intervention um, in, say, hyperlipidemia or other uh, conditions that can be um, at least managed. And I want to mention the last and fourth challenge as a budget challenge. And I think this is something that is, I haven't heard picked up to date, which is every country operates with a, a limited and fixed budget ultimately, even though it's uh, often said that the budget is uncapped. But how much of our budget in total do we want to allocate to each of these different areas of medicine? We know that for implementing some of the uh, genomic testing to a population base or to at least a, um, a pre-screened population base could cost another $100 million a year out of the health budget to say identify a new handful of people who have a condition. Is that worth spending the $100 million or would that $100 million be better spent um, ensuring that Indigenous people had a, had a fairer go to the basics that we all accept as a, as a right? So this ability to actually start to balance how much budget spend we're going to allocate to new therapies, to genomics, versus how much are we going to spend on that budget to things that where we know there are underserved areas where there's additional need that could be easily rectified is a real challenge for government. And, and I would say just in response to, um, I think some earlier comments, MSAC and the PBAC's uh, responsibility to government is to provide advice to government as it reflects its terms of reference around whether things work, how effective they are, how cost effective they are and the budget impact. But where the access is being now um, held up, if you want to call it that, is because once these recommendations are made to government, they are simply recommendations and they will sit in a queue against other recommendations where government has the somewhat unpleasant task of trying to balance spending $100 million here or $100 million um, to say another area like Indigenous health or um, or other areas of inequity in healthcare. So those budgetary decisions are becoming much more to the fore, I think, than they have previously. And I think genomics has really um, heightened the interest in how you make a fair allocation of health budgets to different areas of need um, and not just simply preferencing what is innovative and exciting, but preferencing what will give the most value to the most number of Australians at any, at any given time. So with that, I'll close. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Robin, for those uh, insightful uh, and uh, thought-provoking comments. Um, now, the final speaker um, is Professor Andrew Wilson, who's the director of the Menzies Centre for Health Policy at the University of Sydney uh, and co-director of the NHMRC Partnership Centre on Systems Perspectives on Prevention of Lifestyle-Related Chronic Disease. So he has a very strong focus on public health and disease prevention, especially in chronic diseases, which is most of those I would challenge would be the uh, polygenic diseases, which are uh, pre precision medicine hopes to impact, but which really hasn't been impacted now. It's interesting that most of the speakers that we have have been looking at monogenetic diseases, because I guess in the precision medicine landscape, that's the low hanging fruit. Uh, but it doesn't, may not be where its biggest impact will be if we're talking about diabetes and heart disease and vascular disease and who should get what treatment. So I would like to hand over now to Andrew for his thoughts and comments. Thank you. So thanks, and, uh, and I'd be very happy to talk about all of those things. And in fact, I would probably be more comfortable in tomorrow's session on prevention, talking about pre precision prevention. Um, but today I'm going to, uh, to wear my hat as the chair of the PBAC and reflect on some of the aspects, but basically follow on from some of the things that, uh, that, um, that Robin's just talked about. And uh, um, the chair, the committee that she chairs, the Medical Services Advisory Committee and the P uh, Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, sister committees that cover most of the um, federally reimbursed uh, healthcare services in Australia outside 
uh, of clinical services uh, in public hospitals, etc. So <clears throat> we, we have some particular challenges. Um, uh, Robin's spoken about uh, uh, some of those uh, from her perspective. Before I sort of forget of it, I, I just want to mention in terms of her last one where she talked about the financial impact. One of the other financial impacts that we're going to have to think about when we're talking about genetic therapies in particular is that you pay up front. So one of the things that you're seeing here is we're seeing quite large amounts being asked for uh, the therapies which are available, which in previous times would have been, if you like, amortized over a longer period of time. And that's something which has a whole range of challenges in itself, not the least of which is um, we don't know whether there's a cure at the moment, even though we're paying for the, you know, we will pay for these therapies. We won't know how long that cure will last, uh, which is one aspect of that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, another aspect of it is, and, and then, you know, what does that mean if they then draw, then they then require further therapies uh, following that particular aspect, that that's a, a different aspect of it. Um, this issue of wh whether, whether we're talking about single gene or multiple genes um, that uh, may impact uh, and that will have a, a particular effect once we move out of the sort of single gene environment um, is, is also a, another area of, of concern in relation to this. But there are, uh, uh, it, it is an exciting time and I, uh, and I don't, and I think the, the challenge for us is to think about that whole, the whole notion of what value is and what cost effectiveness is within, this, within the notion of precision medicine. We have, to think, we, we have to think through what it actually means and we will need to be able to present to governments a, potentially a different way of thinking about the value within this context. But there are some other flow on cons 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 consequences from where we're going at the moment. One of the things is that with the speed that we're seeing of therapies being developed and new therapies being developed is that we're seeing um, new medicines coming into uh, onto scheme. And whereas in the past we might have had multiple therapies, we might have had combination therapies for drugs, uh, for treatments, for example, particularly in the cancer area where combination therapy is very common. In the past, what we've seen is that in general, the medicines that we've been combining have been have been medicines which have been off patent, therefore low cost. What we're now seeing is more and more situations where the combinations that people are seeking to use are combinations of on patent, uh, on -patent medicines. And so the cost of those uh, medicines is significantly higher and the benefit that we might be seeing from those combination therapies may be relatively small. Not to say that it's not important, but in the terms that we sort of think about, um, relatively small from that regard. Uh, um, when we're thinking, I mentioned gene, uh, gene therapy before, but we can also think the same thing when we think about CAR-T therapy, as Robin's mentioned, high upfront cost in terms of what they're, at this point in time, a, a significant degree of uncertainty about, uh, what, about what we're paying for in relation to that. What will be the durability of the treatment effect in, in that? A whole range of new issues which are arising uh, in relation to uh, targeted therapies, in relation to the whole notion of precision medicine. Traditionally, the cost of diagnosis has been a relatively cheap part of uh, the, therapy pro the, the therapeutic process. It's been the treatment which has been the costly bit. But as we go chasing rarer, um, uh, uh, rarer variations on tumours, as we try and target more of those, we end up having to, to um, apply our tests to a much larger proportion of the population. That sensitivity and specificity issues about identifying the right, uh, the right patients to give those medicines to becomes a very much more important part in the overall cost effectiveness of the medicine that we might be directing it to. Now that, of course, we hope that things like, um, like uh, whole of gene sequ sequencing, et cetera, will be ways that we can address this in the future, but it won't make the problem go away. We will still be, we'll, we're still having to conduct these tests on a lot more people, and it makes a difference to the way that cost effectiveness looks at it. There are new issues arising from the, the, from the actual way that these um, therapies are being evaluated, which we'll need to think about. Um, at the moment, of course, we're in very early f phases of, of many of these treatments and one of the challenges for Robin and I and our committees 
um, is that the evidence base that we have for the effectiveness of these therapies is very early. And there's a lot of pressure being brought to bear to say, well, we want access to these therapies, even though we don't know what uh, the relative merits or relative benefits of it may be in relation to that. But even as we get a better uh, handle on that evidence, it's likely to come from different sources. It's going to come from things like basket trials. How do we interpret the outcomes of bas basket trials in terms of the traditional ways that we've thought about this? And in the ultimate situation, the sort of thing that Professor uh, Harbour described, where we're t looking about individualised therapy, where you might be actually targeting a therapy to an individual based on a particular marker that they have at that point in time, how do we judge the cost effectiveness in that situation is something that really requires a lot more thought and, uh, and um, both regulatory and, and reimbursement authorities around the world uh, uh, are working in relation to that. So just some thoughts and happy to talk about that and certainly happy to talk about some of the issues around polygene as, as we go as well. Thank you very much uh, for that, um, Andrew. So I'm just wanting to check, uh, do we have Gareth online? Hello. Uh, I can see, oh, Gareth. Hey, so, sorry. Sorry, we have introduced you and time's marching on. So I. I won't give the full introduction again, but I would note that apart from your position as uh, a clinical geneticist uh, in Western Australia and your advice you give to the government there, that you also have a particular focus on equitable health innovation through uh, the public health framework, uh, including um, Aboriginal health and Indigenous health. And I think it would be remiss of us if we didn't, if we're talking about precision medicine, is talk about ways that this will impact that community and ways we can include that community uh, to make sure they partake of the benefits. Um, I'm very mindful of Judy Cho's talk earlier on where she talked about polygenic gene scores and uh, what's been walked out for the Caucasian population didn't work very well in the African-American population. And we needed, they needed that buy-in to work out a risk score that worked well for them. And I would suspect that would be equally true of the indigenous community. Uh, and there are also other social uh, issues and disadvantage issues that need to be addressed. So Gareth, I'd be, we'd be very keen to get your thoughts on that. Uh, thanks, and my, my apologies, I was talking to a, um an Aboriginal mother of the child with a rare disease, and, and it's quite uh, quite a devastating story. But we don't have time to go through that. Um, the, um, I thought I'd just maybe I'll share my screen. Um, it stops flicking around. I'm going to turn off. Right. Sorry, my computer. Uh, I'm going to talk you through what you can't see. Uh, so really until the computer fixes itself. So perhaps this is the digital divide in action. Um, so, so really what I want to talk to you about is, you know, how do we get from the end of one to the end of many? Because the biggest barriers, in fact, for precision medicine, really precision public health and everybody, are about how we're inclusive, how we approach diversity and how we scale. And, and until we do those, do those things, Really, we're extremely rate limited in what is actually going to provide the population scale. We need to move from uh, the concept of precision medicine into precision public health. Um, in fact, a concept that was uh, termed in Australia by the former Assistant Director General of Health in the way Taramura Mantra is really about how you bring the ancient, old, and new technology data together serve the most and the most of need. Um, and really, if we want to talk about ancient uh, ancient, if we want to talk about ancient technology, then there is no better place to think about that than Australia, because we have at least 60,000 years of ancient technology to learn on, uh, learn from and, and, uh, and, and, draw, and draw from. And the thing that ties this all together really is language. In the, in the end, language is culture, language is how we all communicate, um, and language Threaded through uh, precision medicine, be it, the, be it the, the, the four little chemical letters that make up our genetic code, our DNA language, 
be it our phenotypic languages, our shared stories, how disease manifests, um, the precision, the, 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 uh, the, the lingua franca of precision medicine, and human phenotype ontology. If you haven't heard of the human phenotype ontology, it is the thing that is pulling together all the threads of precision medicine, making it both accessible, equitable, and scalable. It's about how you join all these new technologies to get them and weave them together with the, 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 uh, the story of the people, their families, their communities, and their health, and their health journey. Um, really, the limits of, of my language are the limits of my world. Um, and so it's critical that we focus on these, on these languages, how they come together, and how we overcome language barriers. Because still in Indigenous health, language is probably the single biggest fundamental issue to to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, with that in mind, uh, together with um, as part of the United Nations Year of Indigenous Languages last year, we started a project to, to uh, translate Indigenous languages into medical terminologies across the globe. And um, we launched that in Australia, and now we run it through in Africa um, and in Europe, um, and to, um, to uh, North America, China. And, and other areas where really we work together with the youth community and elders to really uh, translate these medical together to get this intergenerational transfer of knowledge where the elders um, are invigorated by their culture being being uh, uh, transmitted we need to reconnect to their community and we really build that around uh, a precision medicine frame a precision medicine framework and then there's the old in 1657, William Harvey, the very famous the physician, said, well, if you really want to understand medicine and transform things, you better go away and study rare diseases. And, you know, 2,500 years later, well, I think we're kind of cottoning on to that. I think that's, that's, uh, that's, that, that's, fab that's fabulous. Uh, um, there are of the zebras amongst the horses. In fact, I think the, the horses are made up of a, of a, flock, of, a flock of zebras, if, if you will really critical that we treasure, treasure, our, treasure our exceptions. And if we think about that from a broader societal point of view, if we think about things that shed insight, that bind communities together, that, that intrigue people and that are valuable. Um, rarity really encapsulates all of those. It could be pink diamonds, it could be pink lakes, it could be high passion, it could be high, it could be high performance. And in the end, it's about celebrating those um, and learning and learning and learning from, and from that. Equally, it's about how you flip things. So, currently, things that have started in rare diseases have provided solutions for all of us. One half of all new medicine comes from rare diseases. One half. Um, we're currently, um, discoveries in the rare disease field have translated to help, for, to help for all of us. And equally, we're now flipping our language paradigms to COVID education response to community members in remote Western Australia, in Ghana, in Mali. And, uh, and, uh, and, and other countries. And that's how we move forward to the new. Um, how do we bring together the information, the knowledge, the stories, the phenotype across species um, to get insights from the insights from man? The Monarch Initiative is a fabulous initiative that's connecting phenotypes and genotypes across species to give us insights so, um, and really is transforming, transforming medicine. And how do we think more broadly about our health? How do we, how do we approach planetary health? Um, how do we how do we think about all the layers of our biosphere and our ecosystem that need to come together to truly Okay, thank you, Gareth. Um, I think um, it, your uh, it's a bit uh, fragmented the voice carryover, so you might make sure you speak close to the microphone. Um, it and I think it's more a technical issue than anything else. So now I would like to open this up. Uh, to the discussion, there's been a lot of questions come in, so we do have a lot of that. So first up, um, as the only in-person representative of the group, Andrew, I'd like to put you in the um, shark's den here, uh, and we'd start firing the questions. So the first question that a lot of people asked was that on one side of the traditional medicine, uh, a lot of people are going down um, the clinical guidelines. So in, in almost every specialty, there's clinical guidelines and it's on basis of evidence and there's level one up to level four evidence. And, you know, whether it's anecdotal or expert opinion versus, you know, multi-centre clinical trials. And, and so that's a, that's a pathway that's going along fairly strongly. And, and it's got a lot of 
positive benefits and people can see why that is being done. And, and then in the, the, the new thing is we've got precision medicine, which I would classify as one of the disruptive technologies. So it's actually sort of upsetting the way we normally do things uh, in, a, in, in a paradigm way. I would argue that the environment, even without precision medicine, is starting to fail in large scale clinical trials because of a lot of the first level drugs are already on board. But how do you think precision medicine, if it's going to impact clinical care, uh, like are we going to go from ch zero children, uh, a cancer initiative at the Prince of Wales and other centres, to being a whole of Australia, a way of dealing with children with cancer, how do we transition prison medicine from that to clinical guidelines? Or how do we marry the two together? Michelle, have you thought about this? Uh, this engages our minds all the time. Um, this is very much, uh, you know, it started off as a research project. It is still a research project. Um, but in children's cancer, the paradigm is very much research as clinical care. Um, so that divide that we heard spoken about earlier, you know, how do we get more clinicians into um, research in children's cancer and particularly now with this framework of precision medicine, you can't be delivering clinical care uh, outside of, well, you could choose to, but this has in fact changed the entire model of care for children's cancer. So this is happening in real time. And so the question is, you know, how, how does that, how do we then get the appropriate um, guidelines and regulations around that? And, and that was alluded to a little earlier in terms of, you know, uh, people wanting access to data and to treatments and we, uh, uh, or to their own raw data or results. We don't have uh, the guidelines or the, um, the regulations. So there's ambiguity around that. There's confusion around that. And I think it is going to need a whole of system approach to, as it becomes clearer and clearer that these precision medicine paradigms can impact on clinical care, how do we, you know, what is the framework? Is it done by disease? Is it done for children's cancer, for example, or for each of these, because the questions in some cases are different, or is it a national approach across the board? Um, and I'd be very keen to hear what others think about that. Uh, Any other comments? I think one of the, the, the key challenges is still siloing. And uh, what I mean by siloing is that precision medicine is obliterating and re-aggregating medicine. And historically, we've worked within specialist lines and we still need, we need to. But in the end, genes don't care what you're trained in. They don't care what you're specialised in and patients care even less. Um, and as we're unlocking the molecular causes of disease, we're finding that this traverses all the traditional, bound all the traditional boundaries. And so it, to be, I, I think it's a time for a rebuild of medicine um, and, uh, and Particularly, I think it's a particular opportunity for generalists. Um, and I think in this, in this new re rebuild of medicine, that those that have multi-organ, multi-system generalist approaches and expertise will be in, in great demand and will be greatly empowered. I, can I uh, add Margaret, to that? You've got yeah. Yes, Margaret. Uh, I think um, as part of that disruption, we've got to recognise the blurring of boundaries between clinical and research roles and there, there is often multiple hat wearing and they do sort of technically have discrete um, obligations um, and legal and ethical duties that attach to each but of course that becomes um, complex where you, you find this sort of intermingling and where um, research is, is in fact um, sort of interfacing so closely with clinical care so I think it does involve a uh, sort of a a reinventing of what our expectations are of people working at working at that interface as part of um, the reimagining of um, yeah clinical guidance in this area. Could, could so, I just um, yes, so yes, Michelle. I was just going to come back with one comment that I think that one of the ways in which we, we can get to where we need to get, and I think that will be fundamental, is really by co-design at the grassroots level of 
uh, the approach to this that is going to, and we're doing this with zero. Where in terms of rolling out this program nationally to the country, we have um, actually MRFF has required us to have a stakeholder engagement plan and a community support plan, where we bring in all of the elements, um, the the families, the doctors, the healthcare providers, the health um, uh, delivery uh, folks, and that we all have to address this as a co-design process from the beginning, very early on. I think that's the only way that we're going to get there as we move forward. I think Robin oh, had yeah. yeah, so just interestingly, uh, we've had a lot of people uh, bring in questions around the issue. A lot of speakers have talked about rare diseases, but actually as we genetically dissect or even some of our most common diseases, we're rewriting disease taxonomy and they're, they're getting smaller and smaller. And perhaps that term has reached its use by date and people are advocating unmet clinical need as more an appropriate term. So you may have breast cancer and that there are subtypes of breast cancer uh, that do remarkably well and that there are others do poorly. And it's in that group that do poorly where we have an unmet clinical need uh, that may need pursuit and looking for an alternative therapy. So people were, have brought that up. Do you think uh, we ought to reorganise how we think about this as, as precision medicine expands out of the monogenetic diseases or single gene mutations for more polygenic diseases? I think I, if, if, I've, if I just spoke from a sort of a reimbursement um, perspective again, um, I think one of the preferences both MSAC and PBAC have is unmet need. I mean, that's one of the first things um, that comes up in consideration of new technologies. As, as Andrew has said, adding on a 0.01% you know, survival gain or improvement to a population that already has 95% survival is less attractive than changing the survival of people who have no treatment options, uh, have appalling outcomes. That's, um, that's, I think, an investment decision. Where do we want to put our energy? And if we don't want to have a very inequitable healthcare system where we've got a lot of people, where a small number of people getting every possible treatment and another group of people getting practically nothing and being um, having poor health outcomes from treatable and preventable um, diseases, then we will sort of ultimately have this inequitable system if we don't take into account unmet need. Yeah, yeah and, and I think it's really interesting, this, this whole concept of what do you call what? Because, I mean, if we looked at cancer, what, what is cancer? Cancer is a heterogeneous group of conditions that have some molecular perturbation in their genetics that causes cells to grow out of control. It's really just a, it's a her heterogeneous group of things. And, and rare diseases are the, are the germline essentially correlate of that. Um, and I think we'd, uh, we'd do our community, our people an extreme disservice if we, if we didn't recognize the, the enormous need and commonality of, of, uh, of rare diseases, which in the end is, is, is tied together by, by, un, by unmet need, just like we wouldn't undo cancer and say, well, cancer's not a single disease. Um, the, and, and so we shouldn't call it cancer, we should call it diseases of unmet need. I think very much the same thing for very much the same thing for uh, same thing for rare, rare diseases. And I think that's why you see the United Nations Human Rights Commission are coming out with it with these strong statements about rare diseases in terms in terms of we cannot achieve universal health coverage until uh, we focus on and address the needs of the needs of people living with rare disease. And we see that coming from Helen Helen Clark when she was the head of the Sustainable Development Goals, making exactly the same statement. So I, I think unless we want to be out of step with the global community, we really need to double down on our focus on, on, on rare diseases. Okay, so it, we do, um, I know there's a big issue about regulation and that's in, essential. And if we, and I think Robin articulated the challenge that governments and health systems have in bringing in new therapies uh, that can be quite expensive. Um, although, and sometimes the, there's the, also the savings about people getting the wrong treatment for a long time and getting all the bad effects without benefit. So 
Um, if we go to the regulatory framework, do, do, you, do the panel feel that the current regulatory framework is fit for purpose? So, uh, and, and you could argue on one hand that it's probably not even without precision medicine because the days of, you know, very few uh, like anti hypertensives or statins um, and treating, having trials of 10, 30,000 people in, in multiple arms are probably not going to get the outcomes you need to get the benefits for the cost in terms of just running that trial or, or getting pharmaceutical companies to pay for those trials when in all likelihood they won't see a benefit even though the drug they have may benefit a specific group. And I know in the research since there's a lot of people moving to adaptive clinical trials or Bayesian clinical trials, do, do people who are working on that, that bit going from research the regulation to approval, do, do we feel that the current system is fit for purpose for what's coming? Um, so I guess Margaret, Robin or Michelle could answer that because they're both dealing with it at different ends. So Margaret, maybe from you to start with. Well, one aspect of regulation that I'd like to touch on, I mean, it's come up perhaps more indirectly relates to um, concerns about um, uses of genetic, genetic and genomic information and um, concerns about discrimination. So uh, one aspect, um, so that, that aspect uh, ha has been somewhat addressed by the Financial Services Council introducing a moratorium on the use of genetic um, or genomic information, giving some assurance to people who have testing that they still can get ins life insurance at least up to a, a certain level. Uh, it's not a foolproof um, protection uh, because it has financial limits and it's only at this stage of moratorium for five years. It's a self-regulated model, not in partnership with government. It's not um, a, um, legally enforceable, but um, it has addressed one of the regulatory concerns about people being deterred from taking up um, clinical um, genomics um, for fear of uh, discriminatory consequences. So that's one aspect that I can perhaps comment on. Thank you. No, I think, um, Phil, just to, I mean, but ultimately in the area of drugs and um, tests, etc., regulation is ultimately about giving a company a permission to sell something. And the regulator is designed, uh, in our case, the TGA, to say, OK, it's reached a standard that says that it's safe enough and effective enough to be sold to the public. Um, that doesn't imply it's better than what we've already got or cost effective or useful in any substantive sense. So um, that comes when you look to health technology assessment committees. That's what, what they do. And I think ultimately this business about whether the regulator is fast enough to pick up new technologies is also a question of risk. Does the Australian population feel comfortable about our regulator in a way accepting, as Andrew was alluding to, patient studies with 10 people in it uh, and lesser evidence portfolios or, and lesser, um, you know, not 20,000 person trials, but you know, 20 person trials, do we feel comfortable allow, about allowing companies to sell to the Australian population um, things that have passed only that standard? And I think the TGA has fundamentally been very risk averse. They, the FDA is risk averse too. They're all risk averse because they're frightened of seeing anything adverse. And I think they have in their mind things like, the, you know, you know the, the story about um, mesh that went in and everyone's up in arms. Why didn't the regulator protect us? You know, they let these people sell this mesh to people in the Australian community and then look what's happened. So that's why regulators are, are very risk averse. And so I think if, if new innovation is to come in in a way that is going to go through that path of the regulator, then either the regulator needs to change, and that means accepting a greater level of risk from the Australian population, or it needs another way to come in that takes the regulator out of the picture. Um, and that comes with a whole lot of other, uh, other risks. Um, but Andrew might want to also comment on this um, because there are ways of trying to consider regulation and reimbursement at the same time. But 
uh, still doesn't get away around from this issue of how do you accept new things with a very limited evidence base. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'd like to make a couple of points really around it. I mean, firstly, I think it's important that the, uh, to recognise that the evidence that you need depends on the question you're asking, right? So the, a regulator is asking a question, is, is the product safe and is, does, is it more likely to be effective than not effective? A funder is asking a question of, is there a, is there a better value in, in, in funding this medicine or this treatment or even this test, diagnostic test than what we do now? It's a different evidence standard, a different type of evidence that's required for those different types of settings. I think one of the challenges in, in uh, where we are with precision medicine at the moment is we are not actually able to say to many patients we are to some, but to many patients, we are not able to say, oh, you've got this marker and therefore getting this treatment will be a better treatment for you than the current treatment, the other treatment options that are available to you. Right? For some patients, we're able to do that because they've either got no treatment options to them or we know that every other treatment doesn't work very well. But for a lot of, for a lot of patients, that is not the situation we're in at the present, at the present stage. And that's why reasonably uh, we, 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 uh, we make some of those things last line or, or second line therapies rather than the, the, the therapy position that we're at at the moment. I also think we, even in that, you know, uh, just to allude back to some of the earlier discussion, you know, the, the notion that we'll blow up medicine as we do it now because we can reclassify diseases and, you know, we can reclassify from disease uh, to some sort of uh, um, genomic uh, indicator of a problem, and it, in you know, I'm a, uh, uh, one of my favourite other areas is the history of medicine. And at the turn of the 1800s, we had 2,000 ways of categorising vomiting. Right? Why did people move away from that? Because it actually wasn't a useful way to direct therapy to actually get people into into treatments. So I think we just need to be a little bit cautious when we go down this pathway and start to talk about you know, a, a process of blowing up medicines, the whole way we categorise medicine, we categorise disease, diseases now to ensure, to ensure that we're putting in place is actually informative in terms of what we're trying to do, which is advise patients about the best thing that, best way that they can, uh, we can deal with their, treat, their, their problems. So one area about, there's two things about that. I, I know because in our field in transplantation, we do a lot with the FDA and if you've got an orphan, um, an orphan indication that they will allow a provisional approval and then collect post-marketing data. So I think the one thing about data which we can get better is that we can do that. And there are drugs like IVIG that are being approved now based on real world data because they know they can't do a clinical trial. So there are other, there are other information out there that didn't exist for us. So th th it, and it brings up two things about this. One is on the side of the data, and there's a lot of data. So sitting behind me here at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital is a mass of clinical data that could be used for bettering patient outcomes, uh, ex except, A, we're not organised to get it and we haven't got patient consent, and there's the real right need for patient to the privacy to the healthcare data. So it, it, one side, we've got the challenge of ethically accessing data but the other thing is actually talking to patients. So in the, what primed me for this was Ian Hickey's question, commenting that as, as patients with depression in Australia are very keen to join these studies. And in the genomics uh, for depression study, they've had 20,000 Australians sign up and more are signing up every day. So it's not, there's not a, a reluctance on the site of, of a large segment of the community to be involved. And, and then also, I know that a lot of regulatory authorities are now bringing in patient reported outcomes. So on the hard metrics that we use to register a drug, if you actually talk to the patients about it, um, that there's some drugs that are much better than others in terms of how they live their life. And that's very important for the people. And, and how they live their life can be more important than death. And we found that out in, in transplantation 
uh, when we surveyed people and we found that the, the patient, the, a lot of patients said they preferred to die than return to dialysis. And that was not the concept we felt we believed from our side. So I think I, I'd be keen to, I suppose, look at that. How can we access real world data and how do we get more of the patient involved in patient reported outcomes rather than hard metrics that we measure? So I might just- Michelle. Yeah, I might just comment on that. I think one of the um, critical, you really, I believe, and we, again, just referring back to zero, it comes back to having a whole of system approach to implementation of personalized medicine. And so uh, one of the things that we felt was extremely important from the very beginning was to have in parallel to our national clinical trial, um, a psychosocial impact study where we uh, were, interviewing, uh, Claire Wakefield has led this program, interviewing the families, the parents, the doctors, the clinicians, the, the researchers, everyone that was involved in their program and finding out what the impact on them, what it feels like and using that to inform the design of the, the next phase of the study. And again, it's this sort of co-design process. I mean, you asked the question, Phil, um, you know, uh, does the regulatory framework, is it fit for purpose? And I think the answer, I think we would all agree, it has to be know that the cross-discipline, multidisciplinary approach is really challenging the regulatory environment. Just as a single example, you know, the current system doesn't allow funding for a, a rebate for genetic counselling, and yet they're a critical cog um, in the wheel. Um, we're challenging, you know, the single disease, single test, type model and but as Robin says it's all about balancing the um, health benefit with the economics of it and I think again there as we think about the economics I think we have to be prepared to think differently about that that it's not just the cost of one treatment against the other but for example with children's cancer at 30 to 70 percent of these children who had diagnosed with cancer actually have lifelong side effects as the result of the chemotherapy treatment. Whereas with the precision medicine, the side effects appear to be much greatly reduced. So we were gonna to have to take things like that as well as the benefits of screening and prevention into account when the regulators begin to make the decisions about what should and should be funded by on a routine healthcare basis. I think one of the key issues which speaks to the the physical panelists uh, comments because i completely agree with them in in the end you need some clarity about how you're going what a disease is and how you're going to treat it and and uh, and so you need really good clinical sense and acumen and categorization and in fact you can do both and the one of the key opportunities for the australian health system and the research community is better disease codification um so and there are there are de facto global gold standards for rare disease coding or phonet coding, and it's, it is built as a clinical hierarchy of things that clinicians recognise as diseases for exactly the reason that the panelists brought up. But it is then interwoven with other terminologies, with other coding systems like the human phenotype ontology that give you that granular precision that you need for precision medicine. So you in fact do both, and you need to do those things in order to get the health economic arguments be it uh, post-marketing surveillance, be it uh, uh, changes in uh, clinical paradigms. And so I think the biggest opportunity for the, for the Australian health system is to better codify d disease. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, that will bring a, a lot of uh, clarity in turn into the economics and into the holistic capture of those costs in the long-term sort of uh, perspective way that Michelle's alluding to, and that will empower all these amazing health data sets that we're, that we're sitting on and to a large degree can't unlock because the, 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 the truth and the knowledge in that data is hidden because it's coded as other. So you make a discovery and then you bury it again as a code called other and you can't track it. Um, so I think actually health system codification is a critical issue for precision medicine. So we, we do have to go on. So I'd like to give uh, Margaret the last word. So over to you, Margaret, especially around the data issue. Around the which, sorry? The, the data, data issue. issue, yeah, look, data. Accessing data. Uh, data is so important to achieve the, the goals of, um, of precision medicine. I think we, we just have to have the mindset of, of respecting who the data comes from. Obviously the, the custodians and the users um, 
yeah, know what they need to go on and do with it. But we need to uh, respect that it has come from someone, um, that it's you know potentially identifiable, that it has these um, broader implications, and uh, we need to to treat it with that respect. So we we need to ensure we have consent. Uh, we need to ensure that the data use is consistent with that consent. Uh, but then um, with that um, purview, we can sort of maximise the, the benefits of, of data utilisation and sharing and linkage and hopefully fulfil goals of precision medicine. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And I'd just like to uh, thank all the panellists for a really stimulating discussion. Uh, we have to fix it up there.